Hello YouTube, I'm famous now, I've got 6 subscribers. And what a better way of celebrating this massive audience other than bringing here a new 3JS project where we are going to learn something new together. Now this time it's a procedural game map. Um, it's made of little tiny hexagons, which is something that I wanted to do in a long time. And every time I refresh the page, it's going to load something new. Look at that. Now, this project is a little bit more complicated from, than the previous one that we did together, but I think that it's simple enough that it can be showcased in a few videos such that we can all learn something cool together. Um, so let's get started, shall we? This time we're going to keep the setup super simple. We're not going to use bundlers, um, so there's no need to create a package JSON or a node package. We can just immediately create our index.html file and initialize it with an Emmet abbreviation. It's just an exclamation mark and then we press space. Then we can add some styling and the new script. Let's now create the script itself and, and import our dependencies. We'll simplify the setup considerably by just importing our dependencies from Skypack with this line. Now we can create a scene and a camera. And now it's time to create the renderer. As a quick reminder, these two lines make sure that the physical values computed by the renderer can be properly displayed on our monitor. Now let's make a self-invoked function. This is going to be useful later. Now we need to set up the render loop which is going to execute this function 60 frames per second, hopefully. Of course, I forgot that we don't have the controls yet, so let's remove this line for now. Let's now create a sphere mesh, and don't forget to import all these objects. Now let's add the sphere to the scene, and let's temporarily change the camera position, just to make sure that we can see the sphere in the scene. Now let's try to run index.html with a local server. I'm using a Visual Studio extension. It's called Live Server, and I'm just right-clicking and clicking Open Live with Live Server. If all went well, this should be the output. Now we need an environment map, and we need the ability to move around the scene. So let's do that next. With the environment map, we first have to import an RGBE loader. Uh, you can use this link to do that. Then you need to actually download an environment map, and for that you have two options. You can either use the one that I'm using and clicking download here on this link, which I'm going to paste in the description of the video, or you can choose one from polyavin.com. They have beautiful environment maps, I highly recommend you this website if you need one. Let's now create an assets folder and paste our environment map in there. There we go, now we can start to process the environment map. Let's make a reference first. And now let's process the environment map. All you have to know about these three lines is that 3JS is processing our environment map such that we can use it in our materials. You don't have to know anything else. Let's now move the instantiation of our sphere mesh inside the async function. Let's use the mesh standard material. And I made a small mistake, I was missing this part here, you have to set the data type to float type, also don't forget to import float type um, for the RGB loader to work. There we go, it works. Now let's add the controls. Let's import the controls, let's create the instance. This line will make sure that we are looking at the origin of the two-dimensional scene. And these two lines are used to make to smoothen out the movement when we are rotating the scene around with the mouse. Now we can include the controls in the render loop. There we go, now we can move the scene around. Okay, now we can start and have fun and make some hexagons. Let's start by including two functions and a new variable. I'm creating initially a new placeholder geometry. This is not going to render anything because it's basically uh, an infinitesimally small box, uh, but this is going to be useful later. We're going to make hexagons with the cylinder geometry function. And we're going to make sure that this cylinder, which is going to look like an hexagon, is as tall as the parameter that we pass to this function. 
this cylinder is also going to have only six sides and this is what is going to give off the impression that it's an hexagon. And then we have to translate the geometry such that it respects the position that we pass as an argument. Now, since we're going to have a lot of geometries, because we are potentially going to make hundreds of hexagons, it's better if we make a single mesh containing all the geometries for all the hexagons. If we do not do that, each mesh would contain a single hexagon and we would have like a hundred draw calls on the GPU every frame, which is something that we want to avoid because um, a separate draw call for each mesh usually tends to be a bit slow when you have hundreds of meshes. In this case, we have the option of merging all these hexagons to get together in a single geometry. That's why I'm creating this variable with this function, merge buffer geometry, such that each time we call this function, we are going to effectively append new geometries on top of hexagon geometries. Okay, now we can start making hexagons. Let's start by removing the sphere mesh. And let's start to call the makeX function such that it populates uh, the geometries of the hexagon here in this variable. With this call, I'm making an hexagon that is three units tall and is positioned at the very center of our scene. And I obviously forgot to tell you where to find the merge buffer geometry library, so let's fix that. Let's go into our import statements. So let's include the merge buffer geometry utility. There we go. As always, we, we're using Skypack to get all our dependencies. Let's go back and let's create a mesh for this hexagon. Remember that this mesh is going to include all the geometries that we are creating with the makeX function, and they're going to be populated in here. We're using our usual mesh standard material, and we're specifying flat shading to true. And we're also obviously adding the mesh to the scene. There we go, we have our hexagon. We need way more than a single hexagon though, so let's start to add a bunch of hexagons in the scene programmatically with a for loop. Okay, let's call this function multiple times. Actually, 20 is a little bit too much, so let's do 10 instead. If we set i and j as the position of the vector, we'll notice that things aren't exactly positioned the way that we wanted them to be. Basically, all of our hexagons are clamped up together, and we have to fix that. To fix that, we're going to create a new function, which is basically going to convert our i and j variable, which will be passed down as parameters on the function, to a real-world vector that is going to position the hexagon on the three-dimensional scene. I'll explain in a second what's happening here, but for now, let's use it. Okay, we've just replaced the vector declaration with a function call. So let's now go ahead and see what that did to our scene. Now take a look. All of our hexagons are correctly placed and spaced um, between each other. One thing that you'll notice is that each raw of this um, of this grid, every hexagon like needs to be placed in an alternating fa fashion. For example, on this raw, the the hexagon at the um, the hexagon that sits on top of this one is placed a little bit more to the right compared to this one, then a little bit more to the left, then to the right, then to the left, then to the right. And so if we go back into our tile to position function, you'll notice that each time tile of y is odd, we're going to add an offset of 0 0.5 to the X position of the tile. This is going to create the alternating effect that we talked about where the topmost hexagon is going to be placed a little bit more to the right, then to the left, then to the right, then to the left compared to the other ones. And instead of explaining to you what these number do, these magic numbers, I want you to play with them and see what happens so that you can understand what I'm doing here. Okay, this video got way too long, so I think I'll stop it here, and in the next one we're going to add a lot more features to this scene that you see now. So, see you there.